You may tell me. Arabic is not my mother tongue. So where do I fit in in this test? Quran has a test even for the non-Arabs. For people who don't know Arabic, everyone in the world, if they want, if they want to try and prove the Quran wrong, they can very well try the level best. I started my talk by quoting a verse from the Quran, from Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 82, which says, أَفَلَا يَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرَانَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ إِنْدِي غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا سِيْ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا That do not they consider the Quran with care? Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been many contradictions. There would have been many discrepancies. The Quran is saying that if you want to prove the Quran wrong, just point out a single contradiction, a single discrepancy, a single fault in the Quran, and the Quran will be proved not to be the word of God. It's so easy. I do know that there are hundreds of people who have pointed out mistakes and contradictions in the Quran. Believe me, all of them, 100% are either out of context, the misquotations, mistranslations, to deceive the people. So far, no one has been able to take out a single contradiction or a single mistake in the Quran. Suppose, there is a Maulana who is very well versed in the history of Islam, but is not very well versed with the scientific knowledge. I do know of several Maulanas who are well versed in Islam as well as science, but suppose there is a Maulana who is only well versed with the historical facts of Islam, but is not well versed with science. And suppose you go to that Maulana and tell him that here, there is a scientific mistake in the Quran. Just because he cannot clarify that scientific mistake, the alleged scientific mistake in the Quran, that does not mean that Quran is not a word of God, because Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 59, that ask the person who is well acquainted with those things. If you want to ask about the Quran, if the Quran speaks about science, ask a scientist. And he will clarify what does the Quran say. Similarly, suppose any one of the audience, they point out an Arabic grammatical mistake in the Quran. I am not an expert in Arabic, I am just a student. And if I cannot clarify that Arabic mistake, if I'm able to, Alhamdulillah. But if I'm not able to clarify that Arabic mistake, since I'm not an expert, that does not mean that Quran is proved wrong. You have to go and ask a person who's an expert in the field of Arabic. So far, no one has been able to take out a fault in the Quran. And inshallah, no one will ever be able to take out a fault in the Quran. After these logical explanation. No human being who believes in a God can say that Quran is not from God. Those people who do not believe in God Almighty, if they say it is different, but a person who does not who is not a Muslim, but if he believes in God, after producing these proofs, even he cannot say it is not from God. So the only third basic assumption remains is that it is a divine origin. The Quran has a divine origin. It's from God Almighty. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Regarding the atheist, those who don't believe in God, all those atheists that are present here, I would like to congratulate them. My special congratulation to the atheists because they are using their intellect. They are using 
their reasoning power. Most of the people in the world who believe in a God, they are doing blind belief. He is a Christian because father is a Christian. He is a Hindu because father is a Hindu. Some Muslims are Muslims because their fathers are Muslim. They are doing blind belief. This is his, even though he may belong to a religious background, to a religious family, he thinks that how is it possible that the people around me, they are worshipping a God which has got human qualities, qualities same as me. How can I believe in such a God? So he says, there is no God. He rejects. Some Muslim asked me, Zakir, how come you are congratulating an atheist? I am congratulating an atheist because he has said the first part of the Shahada, the Islamic creed, La ilaha, there is no God. Now the only part remaining is Illallah, but Allah, which we shall do inshallah. He has agreed with the first part of the Shahada. That there is no God. He does not believe in a God which has got human qualities. So it's our duty now to prove to him about the one and true God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moment an atheist tells me, I do not believe in a God, I will ask him a question. What is the definition of God? What do you mean by God? And he has to answer. You know why? Suppose I tell you that this is a pen. If I say this is a pen, for you to say it is not a pen, you have to know the meaning of a pen. You should know the definition of a pen. You may not know what this is. But if I say this is a pen, and if you have to say this is not a pen, you should at least know the meaning of a pen, the definition of a pen. In the same way, if an atheist says there is no God, he should know what is the meaning of God. And the atheists, they tell me that, see, these people around me, what they worship, what gods they worship, it is their own creation. They have got human qualities. Therefore, I do not believe in these gods. I tell him that even I don't believe in such gods because the concept of God that these people have is the wrong concept. Since you reject the wrong concept, even I, the Muslim, reject these wrong concepts of God, La ilaha. But the moment I agree with him, I have to also tell him the true concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Suppose there's a non-Muslim who believes that Islam is a ruthless religion. It is a merciless religion. It is a religion connected with terrorism. It is a religion which does not give rights to the woman. It's a religion which conflicts with science. And if he rejects Islam, I will tell him, I too reject such a religion which is merciless, which is ruthless, which does not give rights to the women, which is unscientific. At the same time, I have to correct the concept of Islam and tell him that Islam is a religion which is merciful. It has got nothing to do with terrorism. It gives equal rights to the women. It does not conflict with science. It conciliates with science. Then, inshallah, the non-Muslims will accept the religion of Islam. It's our duty to correct the concept. In the same manner, I have to correct the concept of God Almighty, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the atheists. The best definition that I can give of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of God Almighty, from the Holy Quran, is Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, which says, 
قل هو الله احد سيه ذا الله وان اند اونلي الله الصمد الله ذا ابسولوت ان ايترنال مينينج ذا ابسولوت هي ذا ايترنال هي هاز نو بيجنينج هي هاز نو اند هي از ذا وان هو دوز نوت ريكواير اني هيلب هو دوز نوت ريكواير ثينجز تو ايت هو دوز نوت ريكواير سليب هي از ذا وان who helps other people but does not require help allah samad allah the absolute and eternal lam yalid wa lam yulad he begets not nor is begotten he has got no father and mother he has got no children no begotten children wa lam yaqul lahu kufu wan ahad and there is nothing unto him like in this world there is nothing comparable to him in this world the moment you can compare allah subhanahu wa taala to anyone he is not allah subhanahu wa taala wala miqul lahu kufu wan ahad this is a four line definition of allah subhanahu wa taala if anyone who you claim to be god almighty who you claim to be allah subhanahu wa taala fit in this four line definition we muslims we have got no objection to accept him as god almighty to accept him as allah subhanahu wa taala what which are your candidates bring your candidates one by one some may say that bhagwan rajnish oh show he is god almighty let's put him to test the first criteria is qul huwa allah ahad say he is allah one and only rajnish we have several people like rajnish we have plenty of them in our country but still a follower of rajnish will say no rajnish is unique he's only one okay give him chance okay let him pass the first test no problem the second test is allah samad allah the absolute and eternal he does not require any help he is the person who helps other people rajnish we know very well he was suffering from asthma from diabetes he could not cure his own disease what will he cure your disease and my disease when he went to america he was imprisoned by the american government imagine god being imprisoned he could not free himself how will he free you and me when we are in trouble and then he gives the statement that they gave me poison slow poisoning Imagine God can be poisoned. Put him to test. The Archbishop of Greece said that if you do not throw this God man Rajnish out, we will destroy his houses and the house of his disciple. And the president had to throw him out of Greece. Is he absolutely eternal? The third test: Lam yelid, balam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. I don't know how many children he had but I do know that he had a father and a mother he was born on the 11th of December 1931 in Jabalpur and he died on the 19th of January 1990 but when you go to his center in Pune there is mention Bhagwan Rajnish never born never died but visited the earth from the 11th of December 1931 to the 19th of January 1990 they did not mention that he was not allowed to enter 21 countries of the world he was not given the visa he tried to enter he could not enter 21 countries imagine God is visiting the world. God is visiting the world. He can't visit twenty-one countries. Is this the God you believe in? And the last test: Wala mi kulla kufu an ad. And there is nothing like him. There is nothing like him in this world. There is nothing. There is nothing comparable. The moment you can think what God is, you can draw a figure. He is not God. We know very well that Rajnish he had long hair. 
He had a big flowing beard, which was white in color. He wore a robe. The moment you can think, you can draw a picture of God. He is not God. وَلَمْ يَقُلْ لَهُ كُفُوا أَحَدْ If you say that God Almighty, suppose, He is a thousand times as strong as Anil Swashnigar. Do you know Anil Swashnigar? He was crowned Mr. Universe, the strongest man in the world. If you say that God Almighty is a thousand times as strong as Anil Swashnigar or Dara Singh or maybe King Kong, He is not God. The moment you can compare him with anyone, whether a thousand times, whether a million times, whether ten million times, the moment you can compare him with anything, he is not God. There is nothing unto him like in this world. I leave it up to the distinguished audience, the intellectual audience, to decide for themselves that whichever God they worship in, Whichever God they are worshipping, let them put their God to test, to the four tests of the Quran. If the God you are worshipping, if they pass these four tests, we Muslims, we have got no objection in accepting him as God Almighty. Otherwise, you can decide for yourself. After, after giving these proofs, some atheists, they may agree. That, now, we believe in such a God. But, most of the atheists will not agree. They will say, we don't just believe in such definition, we believe in something which is ultimate. We believe in science. I do agree. Today is the age of science and technology. So let's put the scientific knowledge that we have let us apply it to the Qur'an. These atheists, they say, this is the world of science and technology. We don't believe in such gods. Prove to us scientifically the existence of God, then we will believe in it. The first thing I would like to ask a question to these atheists or any educated man who does not believe in a God and who believes only in science, that can you tell me the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of an unknown object? There is an object, an unknown object, an unknown machine which no one in the world has ever seen before or heard of before. Now this machine is brought in front of that atheist or that educated man who believes in science, that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this unknown object? I've asked this question to hundreds of atheists. After a little bit of thinking, he replies, maybe the creator, the person who has created that object, some may say, the inventor. Some may say the manufacturer. Some may say the producer. Whatever they will say, believe me, it will be somewhat similar. Either the creator, the maker, the manufacturer, the inventor. I have asked this question to hundreds of atheists. And all have given me somewhat similar answer. Whatever answer they give me, I accept it. I only keep it in my mind. It will be somewhat similar. The next person may be the person who the Creator has told, or maybe someone does a research. But the first person will be the Creator, the manufacturer, the inventor, or the producer. I ask that atheist who believes in science, how did this world come into existence? How did our universe come into existence? So he tells me, that initially, the full universe was one mass, the primary nebula. Then, there was a big bang, the secondary separation, which gave rise to galaxies. And then for the stars and the planet in which we live, I ask him, where did you get all these fairy tales from? He says, no, 
These aren't fairy tales. These are established facts. We have got proof for this. I say, where did you learn? When did you learn all these fairy tales? He said, no. These are scientific facts. They aren't fairy tales. We learned it yesterday. Yesterday in science means 50 years back. Maybe 100 years back. Yesterday. And in 1973, a couple of scientists got the Nobel Prize for describing the Big Bang Theory. So I tell him, okay, you say it is a fact, I accept it. But what do you have to say about what is mentioned in this Quran 1400 years ago? It mentions in Surah al ambiya chapter number 21, verse number 30. Awalam yaral lazina kafru. Do not the unbelievers see anna samawati wal arda kanat ratkan fafatakna huma that the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. My Quran, which was revealed 1400 years ago, there are enough historical proofs to show it was a book which was present 1400 years ago. How come my Quran says it speaks about the Big Bang Theory? It speaks in a nutshell. You say it was discovered yesterday, 50 years back, 100 years back. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? So this yes tells me, maybe somebody guessed. I don't challenge him. I don't challenge him. I proceed. The world we live in, what is the shape? He tells me, previously people thought the world was flat and people were afraid to venture too far lest they would fall over. But now we have enough scientific proof to show it is not flat, it is spherical. When did you learn? Yesterday, 100 years back, 200 years back in science. And if he has a good knowledge, he replies that the first person who proved that the world was spherical was Sir Francis Drake in 1597. I pose him a question. Analyze what does the Quran say? In Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 29, it says that it is Allah who merges the night into day and merges the day into night. Merging means a slow and a gradual change. The night slowly and gradually changes to day and the day slowly and gradually changes to night. This phenomena is not possible if the world is flat. It's only possible if the world is spherical. A similar message is given in Surah Al-Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 5, that the night overlaps the day and the day overlaps the night. The Arabic word, you will discover as though you coil a turban round the head, coiling. This coiling, this overlapping of the night over the day and the day over the night is only possible if the earth is spherical. It's not possible if the earth is flat. You tell me it was discovered recently. Can you account for who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago. Maybe. It's a good guess. It's a wild guess. It's a wild guess. But it was a guess. I don't challenge him. I proceed. The light that we have, the light that we obtain from the moon, where does it come from? So he will tell me that previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. But today, after science has advanced, we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light, but it's a reflected light of the sun. I will ask him a question. That it is mentioned in this Quran, in Surah Al-Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, Blessed is he who has created the constellation and placed therein a lamp and a moon which has reflected light. The Arabic word for moon is Qamar and the light described there is Munir which is borrowed light or Noor which is a reflection of light. The Quran mentions that the light of the moon is reflected light. You say you discovered it today. 
How come it's mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago? He will pause for a time. He won't reply immediately. And then may say, maybe, maybe it's a fluke. I don't argue with him. For sake, just for the sake of the discussion, I say, okay, you say it's a guess. I don't argue with you. Let's proceed. I ask him that when I was in school, I passed my 10th standard in 1982. I had learned that the sun was stationary. The sun revolved, but it was stationary. So he asked me, does this what the Quran says? I said, no, this is what I learned in school. Is it true? He said, no. Today science is advanced. Recently we came to know that the sun, besides revolving, it also rotates. It is not stationary. It rotates about its axis. And if you have an equipment, you can have the image of the sun on a tabletop. The sun has got black spots. And it takes about 25 days for these black spots to complete one rotation. In short, the sun takes about 25 days to complete one rotation. Does the Quran say it is stationary? He starts laughing. Ha ha. I said, no. My Quran says in Surah Al-Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33. Huwa al-lazhi khalaqa al-layl wa al-nahara wa al-shamsa wa al-qamar kullun fi falaki yasbahoon It is Allah who has created the night and the day, the sun and the moon, each one rotating about its own axis. It revolves and rotates, each one rotating about its own axis. You tell me who could have mentioned this scientific fact in the Quran which was discovered recently. He's silent. And after a long pause, he replies, Let's see, the Arabs were very well advanced in the field of astronomy. So maybe some Arabs told your prophet and he mentioned this in his book. I do agree. I do agree that the Arabs were very well advanced in the field of astronomy. But I remind him that his dates are very poor. The Quran was revealed centuries before the Arab became advanced in the field of astronomy. So it is from the Quran which the Arabs learned about astronomy. It's not the vice versa. The Quran mentioned about several scientific facts. The Quran says regarding the field of geography, regarding water cycle, it says in Surah Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 21, that seest not thou that it is Allah who sends down rain from the top, from the sky, and leads it into the sources of the earth and causes fields of various colors to grow. Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail. It says in several other verses that the water from the ocean rises up, it forms into clouds. The clouds condense, there is lightning, and rain falls from the cloud. It's mentioned in several places in the Quran. It's mentioned in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18. It's mentioned in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24. It's mentioned in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43. It's mentioned in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 48. In several places, the Quran describes in detail. This water cycle, which was discovered by Bernard Palissy in 1580. Only in the year 1580 was this present coherent water cycle discovered. Who could have mentioned the Quran 1400 years ago? In the field of geology, that atheist will tell you, that there is a phenomena known as folding. The earth that we live, live on, the earth's crust is very thin. These mountain ranges, due to the phenomena of folding, prevent the earth from shaking. It gives stability to the earth. I tell him that the Quran mentions in Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 6 and, five, six and 7, that we have made the earth as an expanse. Was Jibala Autada, 
and the mountains as sticks. The Quran says that the mountains are made as sticks, as specks. And this is the description which the scientists give us today. That's like the tent pegs. The mountains are like tent pegs. And Quran gives more information in Surah Al-Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 31. It says that we have set on the earth mountains standing firm, lest it would shake. Quran says that we have made the mountain to prevent the shaking of the earth. That atheists will tell us that even though the salt water and the sweet water, though they meet, they do not mix and separate. I will, I will point out to him a verse in the Quran from Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 53, which says, It is Allah who has created two bodies of free flowing water, one sweet and palpable, and the other salt and bitter. And between them, he has made that which is forbidden to be trespassed. A similar message is given in Surah Rahman, chapter number 55, verse number 19 and 20, that he has made two bodies of water. Between them is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. Today science tells us that salt water and sweet water do not mix. There is a partition. He may tell me that maybe some Arab, maybe some Arab went underwater and he saw the partition and mentioned the Quran. They fail to realize that this is an unseen barrier. The Quran says barzakh, an unseen barrier. And this phenomena is very much evident in Cape Town, that is the southernmost tip of Africa. Even in Egypt, when the Nile flows into the Mediterranean Sea. And the best example is the Gulf Stream, which runs for thousands of miles. Both the waters are present, but they do not mix. The Quran says, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, Verse number 30, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ قُلْ لَا شَيْنْ hai. We have created every living thing from water. Will they not then believe? أَفَلَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Will you not then believe? Quran says, we have created every living thing from water. Will you not then believe? Imagine, in the deserts of Arabia, where there is scarcity of water, who would have ever thought that every living creature is made of water. If they had to guess, they would have guessed everything but water. And today science tells us that cytoplasm, which is the main constituent of the cell, it contains 80% of water. And every living creature contains 50 to 90% water. Who could have mentioned this fact in the Quran 1400 years ago? And that atheist is mum. He does not give you a reply. There is a theory in mathematics known as the theory of probability. Now suppose there are two options. And out of those two options, one is right and one is wrong. The chance is that if you make a wild guess, you will get the right answer. It will be one out of two. It will be 50 percent, for example. If I toss a coin, the chances that I will get the right answer is 1 out of 2, it is 50 percent. If I toss a coin the second time, the chances I will be correct the second time is 1 out of 2, it is 50 percent. But the chances that I will be correct in both the tosses, first and second, will be 1 out of 2 into 1 out of 2, that is 1 fourth or 50 percent, or 50 percent, that is 25 percent. If I throw a dice, the dice has got six sides. One, two, three, four, five, six. The chances if I make a wild guess, I will be right 
is one out of six. The chances I'll be correct all three times. The first toss, the second toss, and the third throw. The chances I'll be correct all three times is one out of two into one out of two into one out of six. Will be one upon twenty-four. Let's apply this theory of probability to the Quran. Suppose we agree for sake of argument. Possible a person guessed. All the matter that's mentioned in the Quran, maybe somebody has guessed. Let us put this theory of probability to the Quran. The Quran says that the world is spherical. What different shapes can a person think of the earth? Some may say it is flat, some may say it's triangular, some may say it's quadrangular, some may say it is it has five it has five sides pentagonal, some may say hexagonal, some may say heptagonal, some may say octagonal, some may say spherical. Let's say assume that you can think of about thirty different shapes for the earth. The chances that if anyone makes a wild guess, he will be right. Is one upon thirty. The light of the moon, it can be its own light, or it can be reflected light. The chances that if anyone makes a wild guess, he'll be right, is one upon two. But the chances that both his guesses, the Earth is spherical, and the light of the moon is reflected, both are correct, is one upon thirty into one upon two, that is one upon sixty. In the deserts of Arabia, what can a person think that the human being can be made of, that the living creatures can be made of? What are the options? What different options can you think of that a living creature can be made of? A person in the desert may think it is made of sand, maybe it's made of wood, maybe it's made of aluminium, of iron, of copper, of oil, of water, of hydrogen, of oxygen. You can make at least ten thousand guesses. And the last that anyone will guess in the deserts of Arabia is water. But the Quran says that every living thing is made of water. In Surah Al-Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, it says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 45, that every animal is made of water. And in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 54, every human being is made of water. If you make a wild guess. The chances that you'll be right is one upon ten thousand. The chances that if anyone makes three guesses and all three will be right, that the Earth is spherical, that the light of the moon is reflected light, and every living thing is made of water, will be one upon thirty into one upon two into one upon ten thousand. It is one upon sixty thousand. It works out to point zero zero one seven percentage. I leave it up to you, the audience, to decide for yourself that if you apply this theory of probability to the Quran, the Quran mentions hundreds of facts which were unknown at that time. If anyone made a guess, the chances that all the hundreds will be right, it will be somewhere very, very close to zero, and in the theory of probability, it will be zero. Some may pose the question: The Zakir, are you using scientific knowledge to prove the Quran? I would like to remind them that Quran is not a book of science. S C I E N C E. It is a book of signs. S I G N S. Quran has got six thousand signs, ayat, more than six thousand, out of which more than a thousand. Have scientific knowledge. I am not using science to prove the Quran right, because to prove anything right, you have to use a yardstick, something which is ultimate. For us Muslims, the ultimate is the Quran. Ultimate yardstick is the Quran. 
Quran is a Furqan. It is a criteria to judge right from wrong. But for that atheist, for an educated man who does not believe in God, for him, science is the ultimate. It is his yastik. So I'm using his yastik to prove whatever Quran has said. And we know very well that many a times science takes U-turns. Therefore, I have only spoken about scientific facts which have got evidence and proof. I have not talked about theories which are based on assumptions. I am using his yardstick to say that whatever your yardstick has said recently, hundred years back, it has already been mentioned in the Quran. And finally, we come to a common agreement that the Quran is more superior than science. So Quran is the ultimate yardstick, not science. Quran mentions about several scientific facts. Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 53, that the plants have been created in pairs, which we discovered recently. It says in Surah Raj, chapter number 13, verse number 3, that the fruits are created in pairs. In the field of geology, it's mentioned in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 38, that the animals and birds live in communities, which science has discovered recently. The Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 68 and 69, it is the female bee which goes out and collects the honey. It is not the male bee, which science has discovered recently. These bees, they describe the pathway of the new garden they have found by the flapping of the wings. It's mentioned in the Quran, which we discovered recently. The Quran says in Surah Ankabut, chapter number 29, verse number 41, that the house of the spider is fragile. Besides describing the physical nature of the web of the spider, it is also describing about the relationship, the family relation, in which many a times the female spider kills the male spider. The Quran says in Surah Namal, chapter number 27, verse number 17 and 18, that ants are talking to one another. You may think it's a fairy tale book. What? Ants are talking to one another? Today science tells us the insect or the animal which has the closest resemblance to the lifestyle of the human being is the ant. It buried the dead. It has a very high system of communication. It has marketplaces, etc. Quran also speaks about medicine. It says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 16 and 69, that you get the honey from the belly of the bee, which we discover today. And in the honey, there is a healing for mankind. Today science tells us that in the honey, there are antiseptic properties. No wonder the Russian soldiers used it to cover their wound, which left very little scar tissue. It is used in the treatment of certain allergies. Quran speaks about physiology. It says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 66, and Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 21, it describes the blood circulation and the production of milk. And 600 years after the Quran speaks about blood circulation, Ibn Nafis discovered it. And 1,000 years after the revelation of the Quran, did William Harvey made it fit to the Western world. Quran speaks about embryology. The first verses of the Quran to be revealed were from Surah Alaq or Surah Ikra. It says, Ikra, Bismi Rabbi Kaladi Khalaq, Khalaq al Insan Amin Alaq. Read, recite, or proclaim in the name of thy Lord who created, who created the human beings from something which clings, a leech like substance. 
This and several other embryological data, which is given in the Quran, was taken to Prophet Keith Moore, who happens to be one of the highest authority in the field of embryology. He lives in Toronto in Canada and was asked the question, whatever matter the Quran speaks about embryology, is it true? Some Arabs followed the guidance of the Quran. If you are in doubt, ask the person who knows. So they asked Prophet Keith Moore, is it true? He said, that majority, majority of the matter in the Quran is 100% perfect, matching with the latest discovery of embryology. But there are certain statements in the Quran which I cannot comment on because I myself do not know it. And one such verse was this, that they have created the human beings from something which clings a leech like substance. He said, I do not know whether an embryo looks like a leech. He went and got a photograph of a leech and examined in his laboratory in a very, under a very powerful microscope, the early stages of an embryo and it exactly matched with the photograph. And then he said, whatever the Quran mentions is perfectly right. And whatever new data he got from the Quran, he incorporated it into his book, The Developing Human, and took out a third edition for which he got the best medical book written by any person in that year. And he said, that whatever the Quran mentioned, all the things about embryology we discovered recently. It's one of the latest branch of medicine. It cannot be written by any human being. It has to be of divine origin. The Quran says in Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 5 to 7, it says, Does not man think from what is created? is created from a drop emitted from between his backbone and ribs. No, the organs, the, the, the genital organs, the testes and the ovaries, during the embryonic age, they develop from where the kidney is placed, between the backbone and the 11th and the 12th rib. The Quran says in Surah Najam, chapter number 53, verse number 45 and 46, and Surah Qiyama, chapter number 75, Verse number 37 to 39, it says that it is the male which is responsible for the sex of the child, which we discovered recently. The Quran says that the embryo is covered, that the fetus is covered in three waves of darkness, which is confirmed today. The Quran embryonic stage, the embryonic stages in great detail. And for a Mominun. Chapter number 23, verses 12 to 14, and in Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 5, it says that the human beings have been created from a minute quantity of liquid, from something which clings a leech like substance, then made into a mudga, a chewed like substance, then made into izaman, that is bone, then clothed with lahem, that is flesh. Quran describes the embryonic stages in great detail. The Quran also mentions Surah Sajda, chapter number 32, verse number 9, and Surah Insan, chapter number 76, verse number 2, that it is Allah who gives you the faculty of hearing and sight. And today medical knowledge tells us that the hearing comes first. It is developed completely by the fifth month of pregnancy and then the eye is split open by the seventh month of pregnancy. Quran gives the reply in Surah Kiyama, chapter number 75, verse number 3 to 4, that when the question is posed, how will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assemble the bones on the day of judgment? Allah replies that we will not only be able to assemble your bones, we shall even assemble your very fingertips. Quran is saying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can also assemble your fingertips. What does it mean? In 1880, Sir Gold, he described the method of fingerprinting, which today we use it 
to identify people. No two fingerprints, even in a million people, are identical. Quran speaks about fingerprinting method 1400 years ago. There are several examples of science. If you want to know about the scientific knowledge, about the scientific knowledge which is mentioned in the Quran, you can refer to my video cassette, Quran and Modern Science. Conflict or conciliation, which is available for sale in the fire. I would like to give one more scientific fact. That there was a scientist in Thailand by the name of Professor Takashan, who did a great deal of research in the field of pain receptors. Previously, science thought that only the brain was responsible. Only the brain was responsible for the pain. But recently, we have discovered that there are pain receptors present in the skin which is responsible. Quran mentions in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 54, that as to those who reject our signs, we will cast them into the hellfire. And as often as the skin is roasted, we shall change it with new skin so that they shall feel the pain. Indirectly, Quran is saying there is something in the skin which is responsible for the pain. It is giving an indication about the pain receptors. At first, Professor Takashan could not believe. On verification, when he realized that this book is speaking about pain receptors 1400 years ago, he embraced Islam in a medical conference in Cairo and said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, that there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad the peace be upon it is the messenger of Allah. Then you pose the question, atheist, who could have mentioned all these scientific facts in the Quran? The only reply that he can give you is the same which he gave you earlier. Who is the person who can tell you the mechanism of an unknown object? It is the creator, it is the inventor, it is the maker, it is the producer. In the same way, the person who can mention all these facts in the Quran is the maker, is the producer, is the creator of the universe and its content, which we call in English language as God and more appropriately in the Arabic language as Allah. Francis Bacon has rightly said that little knowledge of science makes you an atheist. But an in-depth study of science makes you a believer in God Almighty. No wonder today scientists are eliminating the models of God, but they are not eliminating God. They are eliminating models of God, La ilaha, but not God, illallah. I would like to end my talk by giving the translation of the second verse that I quoted in the beginning of my talk from Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 53, which says, Sanurihim ayatina fil afakhi, wa fi anfusihim, hatta yatabayyana lahum anna ulhaq, awalam yaksi bi rabbika, anna hu ala kulli shayin shaheed. Soon we shall show them our signs in the furthest regions of the horizon and into their souls. Until it is clear to them that this is the truth. Wa akhrud da'wan alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Thank you. Jazakallah khair for the very rapt, uh, kind and rapt attention you all have shown during the course of the lecture. Now we come to the second part of our session. And we hope to have a similar, in fact, a better interest of yours. That is the question and answer session. Arun Shauri says that in the Quran in chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, if you add up the different parts of inheritance given to the highs, 
the sum total is more than one. Therefore, Arun Shori claims that the author of the Quran does not know maths. Please clarify. I was a Christian and embraced Islam in 1980. How can I convince my parents, who are yet Christian, that Prophet Muhammad, please be upon him, did not copy the Quran from the Bible? Dr. Sakir, is it not contradictory that the Quran calls Iblis an angel in one place and a jinn at another place? Now we believe that God is supernatural and He can do everything. A non-Muslim friend of mine has a question, why is it that God does not assume a human form? Can you please explain? There are a thousand things I can list which God Almighty can't do. God is not supernatural. God cannot do everything. God cannot take human forms. And one Muslim friend also told me that Islam believes that Jesus was born of a virgin and he was born by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he was not born in the natural way. Now this proves that Jesus Christ, if he is not God, at least he is great.